Filip uh, and uh, Marcus Katarina are back on stage. And I'll start with the first question to, uh, to Kyle, uh, or maybe first to the audience. Uh, so uh, who of you knows that if you git push, you can git push with force? <laughs> who knew that you can also do git push force with Liz? OK, quite a few, but less. I must say I, I learned that from Magit. So you didn't show us the. Uh, push interface, but uh, in there you, you have both options listed. And I think that's uh, uh, one thing that I like about it is that uh, it doesn't try to, in my view, it doesn't try to hide the complexity of Git. Uh, to the contrary, it puts this uh, complexity at your fingertips. Uh, so to the question, do you th was this a conscious design decision or was it something that kind of happened because of the because the transient menu, menu was what the developers had to work with uh, yeah so I, I think that's a that's a very good point and I think a lot of people say that um, that yeah they it using the git teaches them more about git uh, it certainly wasn't my decision so perhaps I, I can't say what uh, the intent of other, uh, you know, uh, Jonas and and even the original creator, uh, Marius, what their intent was, but I, I think that probably was, yes, very much to provide an interface that exposes the complexity and, and maybe makes some things more streamlined when you want it to be, but in general does not hide it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is a very good point, and I would say, yeah, that's very much a design goal, at least at this point, to keep it that way. All right, and now to the audience. Questions to all our panelists. I think Joey can start. So Kyle, are you familiar with Magit Annex? I know it exists, and I know nothing else. I am. I, I wrote that in uh, 2014. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, 20 minutes, uh, but yeah. So, so I did, I wrote it. Um, I still use it probably every day. Um, it certainly could use more love, uh, more time. Uh, I'm interested if anyone wants to contribute. I, uh, I was wondering if it did anything along the same lines of making things discoverable, you know, the there, same kind of, yeah. Yeah, there's a transient, the transient menu uh, that, so Jonas created that library and, and lots of packages use it now, not just uh, Magit and Magit extensions. And so it uses the same um, transient, the, the amount of actions are limited, but a lot of the file actions you'd expect, so you know, unlock a file, get files, all of that's exposed through a transient, um, sync. Um, so basically things that I used and wanted. Uh, you can, of course, add files directly with git annex add with a, a similar to how you press S in that buffer. You can press, I think it's uh, uh, um, an, uh, at sign. I was Struggling to come up with the name. Anyways, um, yeah. So and but it doesn't offer much else. It's like there's an unused log, um, and, and um, maybe a, yeah, and list. There's an interface for parsing the git annex list output. But yeah. Hey, I have a question about this uh, secure health data um, processing um, because it exposes this very interesting conflict between decentralized and centralized management for me. And I'm thinking about it at a bigger level. How much integration is there from the community or is there an evolving community that kind of tries to tackle this problem together? Because it seems a very fundamental one. And I can see an option that every institution goes it their own way, but I can also see that it becomes centralized. And maybe I just misremember things, but I also believe I heard that there is uh, like standards evolving from the European Union or something, for example, um, that actually characterize what a system needs to fulfill. And you guys also mentioned a bit um, that there are feedback processes 
could you explain that a bit more? Like, how does that look like in practice? How integrated is this also across institutions? And how much regulation is there at the moment that actually specifies how systems should look like? Yeah, um, so uh, this kind of, uh, so our, our approach comes from the time before this was kind of this political top topic. So we had some, some goal that we're now trying to, to, to fulfill. And we are, um, we did not look too much into this, uh, into the compatibility with the European health data space, basically, but um, there might be some applications there. Um, this is, but it's a good point. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, okay. Uh, so the, the European Health Data Initiative, um, which basically says, okay, uh, we want to have a, a central um, actor, sorry, missing, a, a central central file uh, for every patient, and uh, um, th things like this have have been discussed in German healthcare for at least twenty five years, uh, and and there's always been a, a very strong push against this, and but now that it's coming via the European level, there's a lot of political will. Um, might have something to do with the current uh, health minister in Germany. Uh, to to uh, lead in that uh, process and 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 get the health data of uh, German patients into a mineable format very quickly, uh, and um, not in in my opinion, um, this is not not a process that's very very well thought out. So. Uh, the reason why we um, get a lot of good feedback right now for for our approach is because it comes from the point of view of decentralization and of, of um, taking care of patient data first. And, and, and so we might be already too late to, to establish it in, in a broader context, or we might be uh, just... Uh, uh, at the tip of this discussion, which is which is going to become a broader societal discussion, we have no idea right now. We're we're trying to get the technical thing off the ground, and then um, we'll see what happens. But your, your question about feedback was more about the feedback process in the. Uh, no, I think that thing. clarified things. I, I was just wondering how much regulation there is actually about the infrastructure part, right? Like, I, I know that some people probably are also lobbying for certain solutions more so than others, right? So I was really wondering about what the landscape looks like, whether it is a centralized attempt or like a special interest group attempt that's also trying to convey what the technological possibilities are, because some of these are, you know, innovative tools, and I wonder whether those are already in consideration also by lawmakers and policymakers, ultimately. I don't think I can really answer the question. Yeah. So um, I come from a medical family myself, so I've, I've been following the discussion, um, and and I haven't seen a whole lot of, of uh, discussion about decentralized approaches here. So it's more like, okay, if we give the, the uh, patient case files to the health insurance uh, companies or, or um, public companies, it's in Germany often, um, if they, they're uh, by law demanded to, to control these and, and regulate this, uh, how secure is it going to be? Um, and, and I haven't seen a whole lot, whole lot of discussion. Do we really need that or um, can we get away with making health data more interoperable by going to standards like FHIR, so that's F-H-A-I-R, for those not familiar, um, and, and uh, 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 making it so, so different uh, physicians uh, can, can search data, data better that other physicians have collected. Um, we are, we are aware of that approach and have been discussing it for quite a while. Um, but right now, the push that I see publicly is, is to, to very, go in a very centralized direction. Thanks. Yeah, so, so what I wanted to uh, also make clear, like why I'm so unsure to answer this, is like this is 
this is such a broad like medical data it's like there's so many categories of medical data it's like um, so the a whole lot of the discussion is about routine data that's kind of um, that's the data that's um, that's captured when uh, patients uh, are treated but there are like there's a lot of other data for, for example data that's um, that's uh, uh, that's uh, created when the people are in studies, then there's uh, the, the, like there's a whole lot of categories and I would uh, like to be careful to, to, um, to generalize here because I think it's, it will be um, for, 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 so from my experience, this data is handled very, uh, in a very diverse manner right now. So um, I'm not sure if, if there's, this one solution coming right now. I don't see it in Germany, at least. Uh, I would like to come back to your suggestion of operating on different Git Annex branches or like separating annexes or whatever. Um, I think I didn't quite understand what you think you would gain from that. Can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, actually, actually, I thought again uh, while I was listening to your talk, I thought about this question uh, um, some more. And I think for me, it comes down to um, a, a, a separation of concerns point of view. So, so um, it might be a bit cleaner if you say, okay, this data set with the metadata that's describing it, which we know in, in Git Annex is, is not. Uh, necessarily uh, personal data, yeah. So, so it's just uh, the hash, uh, so which we hope is non-revertible, and, and the cryptographers tell us uh, it isn't revertible. Um, and uh, uh, tracking this this in, in separate uh, Git Annex subtrees, um, in my mind, makes it easier to. To reason about, but uh, it also gives up the, this um, GitOps principle of uh, we have this one repository that that has all the knowledge, and um, Git Annex does something very interesting uh, uh, that it can tell us: okay, um, this and this machine or environment has made a copy of this specific file, and uh, we're not not sure in in how much detail we'll be able to do this, but. Yeah, if, if we have the separated uh, environment that that uh, um, calculates a, stat a statistical analysis and the output of that is reviewed very carefully, um, we might still be able to uh, merge information that uh, of changes that happened on the Git Annex branch back into the main repository. Yeah, um, but then we need to be careful that this is really only get well, annex uh, metadata and, and, and not uh, uh, a data path that can lead leak data by some scientist who's, who's not well-meaning. Yeah. So the concern really is about uh, what may end up in annex metadata and therefore in the annex branch? Yeah, for me, I, I think it's, it's well controllable um, what will end up in, in uh, the metadata, but it might be easier to to reason for for non -te technical people if, if we separate the whole world. Yeah. Um, in my mind, it, it's going to be a, a better experience if, if we have that one Git Annex repository and that one Git Annex branch, uh, and it will um, ease our development of, of software on top that allows for the reviews, etc. Okay. Thanks. And next question is yours. We'll make him sweat here. <laughs> question to Kyle. Um, so I use my Git only pretty much when I need to stage chunks, right? Because what you showed is so convenient. What should be my next feature which triggers me to load that Emacs operating system? Yeah, I, I would say the, the, the instant fix-up variants that I showed are, are pretty... Like I, I've, 
So I, I use the command line a decent amount um, for, for Git operations too. You know, I'm, I'm in a server I, I, and, and stuff. And, and the thing that I feel the most is, is probably, yeah, the staging you mentioned, that's a big one. And then the, the fix up uh, variants to really just quickly, you know, uh, kind of polish the series with additional changes. I, I, that's probably. No, yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, there's a lot I didn't show, of course, and of course, someone would mention. I was like, oh yeah, that too, and that too. But I, I would say that the kind of series refinement mm -hmm. commands are probably way up there for me. Yeah, and uh, while you were presenting, I shared on the chat Junior's interview, right? Interview of Junior, who is maintainer of Git, and pretty much what struck me most in that interview is that what he thought is the greatest thing of Git is that with that this distributed work, you could make regular programmers to look like a great programmer. When you don't yeah. rush committing and pushing, right, but you take yeah. care about going through the history. I, I tried to work this in the talk, but I, I couldn't make it work. It says more about me, but Joey <laughs> has this really old post, like a while ago. He probably doesn't even remember. It's like called like our beautiful fake histories. And, and I just, for some reason, just like, you know, took up space in my brain, and I always remember it. And I think, and, and like his point with that is like, he's basically like just saying, look at all these options that like Git commit has for refining, and like I think it actually is more about Git bisect or something. But anyways, just that that kind of came in my head, and like maybe Joey, like Joey, Joey's history is I've had to go through it a lot when working on data. It's very nice with very informative commit messages. He might be able to do that first pass. There is no way I am ever doing that first pass. I need, I need to refine series. So yes, th that's why the commit refine, like exactly what you said in terms of making, yes, someone that cares enough look like a really good programmer, that's what, that's what it can do. Um, about the platform, you said that <clears throat> how do you guarantee that those environments are reproducible, right? You mentioned they've been reproducible builds, but then there was this Mer Merkle tree, and that was the answer, right? So could you give a little bit more details? Like, w do you generate containers? Do you ensure that they're reproducible by using snapshot repository of Debian, or what's the juice, secret juice there? Uh, yeah, so, so um, of course this is somewhat aspirational, uh, the, the reproducibility and, and uh, will, will have to be uh, measured against the real world. Uh, so what kind of um, algorithms uh, data scientists uh, come up with and, and often data scientists that are not uh, really that deeply and into IT engineering, I would say. Yeah. Um, so, so what, what we want to do is, is create an environment uh, where it's trivial and where, where you have a short feedback loop. Um, if, if you leave the path of best scientific practices, yeah? So we, are, we have the in interactive environment because yeah, if, if you don't know what you're doing with some data, you want some kind of REPL, yeah? And, um, and, and uh, Marcus has told about the, um, in my opinion, pretty ingenious way he came up with that, that we can even uh, uh, take out the element of, of copy and pasting uh, what's shown to you in the web browser, yeah. uh, uh, or, or that, that danger that exists there. And um, then in the interactive environment, you would uh, develop an algorithm and uh, the output of that in, of that algorithm, uh, you can see some numbers, but but basically, in the format that you can can officially get it out and, and use it in your published paper and so on, um, would then come out of the uh, non-interactive environment. And, and so, uh, if these differ, yeah, or, or maybe we can can run the non-interactive environment in, in on two different machines. Yeah? Um, if, if the outputs differ, then, then you know, as a data scientist, you messed up somewhere. Yeah, so uh, about this execution uh, environment, we, we, I, I thought uh, about some, some uh, approaches there. So yeah, we uh, have the 
uh, the hash from the OCI image, but I also thought about like you could also push the um, you you can export an OCI image as a tree. You can also could put that in Git Annex. I'm not sure if this is really good, but then you could like uh, like version the whole uh, the whole image with. Uh, That's exactly what we do, and there there is a person even who coded it up. Yeah, there is data led container. Uh, yeah, we, we, need to, we need to we do not look into that. From from what I remember, was the data led container kind of did not have the right. I could not get it to to deploy in the scenario I wanted. I, I but I wanted to look deeper into it because I was like, this is uh, basically it assumes that you run the data led command in a uh, machine that can run a container. But when when I'm I want to kind of provide the container from the outside and then people to work inside of it. Like this might be some Matroshka problem here. Uh, so yeah. We could talk more about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So so I'm I'm not I, I thought about this uh, yeah. We have time for one more quick question. <coughs> so a uh, quick question. I I, I don't know whether you would hand out uh, NX repositories from that environment for people to, to use. Um, but if you do, or if anyhow the keys show up uh, in, in, the, in the output, do you deal with cross-referencing two files in where people only have access to the files in one context and should not know that the same file was used in another context? Uh, yeah, this is, this is a really, really good point. Um, something we also considered for this uh, outlet review is to, uh, for example, go through all the pseudon pseudonyms for and, and see, okay, is there anywhere is the pseudonym inside of this outlet data, and then just automatically say, okay, this, this must not go out, uh, for example. 